Father, we come before you, Lord. We thank you. Thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the move of your Holy Spirit in this place, Lord. I am fully expectant that there are going to be a, just an influx of testimonies of people that have received the gift uh, of healing, Lord, that, that you have spoken to, Lord, that you have moved on, Lord, that your supernatural peace has been upon them. And Lord, we thank you for your move tonight. And God, we ask that you would continue that through your word to speak to us tonight. God, we ask that you would just open our hearts. Lord, soften us. If, if, if it's an ouch message, if it's not an amen, but an oh me message to us, Lord, I pray that you would just soften our hearts, that we would walk out of this place encouraged to be who you've called us to be, Lord. And we thank you that we're all on this journey. We're all on this process together to, to, to become like Jesus, our ultimate example. And Lord, we give you the praise and the glory. We fully acknowledge we don't come into this place to hear from the man, from the older, from the young. Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we ask that you would speak to your church, speak to your people tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, amen. amen. Well, on Sunday, I asked a question, and it was great. I felt so good because pretty much everybody else had kind of responded to the question that affirmed that I wasn't alone. And today, I want to ask you another question. Have you ever gotten fired up about something? I mean, have you ever just seen something, and man, it just downright ticked you off? You felt like you needed to get on a soapbox. You felt like you needed to tell somebody how it was. You felt like you needed to voice Something that they just needed to hear. And you know what? You, almost, you, you even love them so much that you just had to tell them the truth. Anybody, anybody ever been there before? Maybe, maybe in, in the honesty of raising your hands, maybe, maybe you could admit, you know what? There's been times where I've probably taken it a little too far. Maybe I got a little bit too righteous on that. Maybe I stood on that soapbox a little bit too long. Or maybe I was standing on the soapbox that I should be listening to instead of standing on. Ultimately, I think we've all done that before. I remember there was a time. You remember uh, when, in last January when there was that big measles outbreak? Did anybody remember that? Everybody was afraid because like 11 people in the world got measles. And... <laughs> like it just revolutionized the world. Like it just changed. I mean, it was an epidemic, right? I remember there was a time my little girl, Emma, she got, uh, she got little red spots, like all over her body, and my mother-in-law was watching her, and she was just kind of going through, and she took them to a family event. We were at church, I believe, and my mother-in-law had my little girl, Emma, and she took them to a family event, and the family freaked out. Now, to, to specify so that people aren't judging on the front row, this was not Pastor Jessica or Pastor Dan or, or my sister Kim or any, any of my family, Amen. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I love my in-laws. They are amazing. But my, they, they, it was at an in-law family event, right? It was at Stacey's family. And, and I remember they just got so upset. They got so upset that, that they would bring my little girl around. Now, we had already gone to two doctors because, you know, I mean, it, it was an epidemic. I mean, 11 people got it, right? So we went to two doctors just to make sure. And, and, and they said, you know, it's, it's obviously it's clearly not measles, okay? It's probably just a little, you know, infection or it could just be some kind of skin irritation. Well, either way, her family just lost it, some members of her family. And I'll tell you what, man, it was so easy to get on the soapbox. I remember I did what the logical and the loving conclusion was, is I sent them an emotional text via text message. You know what I'm talking about? Because that's probably the best and greatest way to communicate when you're upset is to text somebody back. And I remember we were just like, you know what? We're never talking to them again. It's like, no matter what we do, it's never good enough. Our kids are always sick. Or our, blah, blah, blah. And we were just, we just got so much on our little soapbox that we were like, that's it. We're done. Forget it. And her mom got on board, and she's like, I'm tired of it. And we were all just real upset, man, because it's easy. It's easy to get offended. It's easy to get to see something that just really, man, I'll just tell you what, it really just riles you up. It really just gets you fired up. And, and you just feel like, you know what, I got the obligation to tell somebody the truth. And, you know, we, we've all been there in some way. We've all done it in some way or fashion where we've spoken we, we, we've, we've taken that stance, we, we've said th things or we've done things or in this age where, where everybody has a platform nowadays, you know, all, all Christians want a platform and now we have a platform where nobody is listening but yet everybody is listening at the same time, social media. And we take to these platforms, we take to these opportunities and we just, man, we just kind of go crazy because we have this obligation to tell the world what they need to hear. I mean, Jesus told us that, right? Or did he? Today, I want to take you to this place. I'm going to title, title the message, What's Love Got to Do With It? Amen. I think Tina Turner had something going on. 
What's love got to do with it? If you got your Bibles, go with me to John in the 13th, 13th chapter. John chapter 13. John chapter 13. You see, we all, sometimes we feel, you know what, I, I love you. Have you, ever, have, have you ever heard someone tell you this? They, they, they pretense it before. I love you. And because I love you, dot, 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 don't get mad at me for what I'm about to say because I love you for it. You know, we, we think because of that, we have this obligation. We have this, this right, so to say, to, 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 to get riled up, to, to, to get fired up about some things. And I think Jesus paints a clear picture. Jesus gives us a response. He gives us an answer that's not necessarily the natural human response, but it is the God response. In John in the 13th chapter, verse number 34, so familiar, we know this. But look what Jesus says. He says a new commandment. It's amazing that it's a new commandment. I mean, here we are, we, we read this retrospectively. It's 2,000 years after Jesus said these words, and here we are tonight reading these words. So to us, like in the book of 1 John, John kind of reiterates this. He says, it's not a new commandment. But at the time when Jesus was speaking to his disciples, he says this amazing thing. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Amen. Praise God. That's great. Period. Finish it off. Jesus wants us to love us. As a matter of fact, somebody came to Jesus and said, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, what did he say? He said, you love the God with all your, love God the Father with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then the, the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. The golden rule. But look what he says, as I have loved you. As I have loved you. He says, you, you see, you might have heard some things. You might have heard that because I love you, I'm going to say this. Because I, I, I'm in love with God, I'm going to say it like it is or whatever it might be or I'm going to post this because or I'm going, to, I'm going to get on this or whatever it might be. Or somebody's told you something that you said, man, you know, I don't need another person to tell me how bad I am. Anybody, anybody else got a witness? I don't need another person in the world judging me. I, I, I do a pretty good job at it myself. And it seems like in the name of love, Oftentimes we say things that aren't acted out in real love. And Jesus says, I have a commandment. I want you to love one another. But he says, I don't want you just to love one another. He says, I'm going to set the example. And I want you to love one another as I have loved you. That you love one another. He says it twice. You think that means something? How about three times? Look at verse number 35. He says, by this. This is where it's really important. By this. What? Love. But not just love, love like Jesus loved. He says, by this, all will know you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. You see, we, we want people to know that we are God's disciples because we give ourselves a label. Christian. I want people to know that I'm a disciple because I wear a cross. I want people to know that I follow Jesus because I have a sticker. I want people to know that I follow Jesus because I want them to know because I post it on social media that I attend church once a month. And because of that, I want them to know I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a Christian. But Jesus says it's not your church attendance that people will know. It's not the stickers on your car, or maybe take it to Jesus' day. It's not the, not the marking on your mule. How about that, okay? It, it's not the conversations that you have out loud that people will know that you belong to me. He says, it's by your love that the world will know you are my disciples, followers of Jesus. And you see, it's really easy to look at that verse and say, man, that's a tough verse. It's easy to say it's hard. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because I'll just tell you about me. I'm an emotional guy. Pastor Dan, today at 10 o'clock, will tell you in our meeting, I'm an emotional guy, all right? My wife will tell you I am a prima donna, self-admitted, all right? I bet I'm not alone. I bet you're an emotional person too. We're emotional. God created us with emotions. And what happens is, is through the course of emotions, it becomes really hard to love. Especially when we're wounded. Especially when we're, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, offended. Oh man, it's like so easy to be offended today, right? And in the course of emotions, we get wrapped up in this word love. As a matter of fact, remember how I told you the title of the message was, What's Love Got to Do With It? I think Tina Turner's song had a great overview of how we feel. What's love 
got to do with it. Got to do with it. What's love, right? But a secondhand emotion. It's easy to love when everything's good. It's easy to love my wife when everything's fine and dandy. It's easy to love my kids when they're uh, amazing gifts and angels from God. <laughs> it's amazing. How, how about this? It's amazing to love other brothers and sisters when they speak and believe the same thing I do. But how about when they don't agree? How about when they are across the line of another denomination, another name, another message, another philosophy or way of thinking, it gets a little harder. Why? Because we have disagreements. Why? Because there's all sorts of name calling here and there and this and that. And Tina Turner, in this song, really, I think, nailed human condition. What's love got to do with it? I'm hurt. I'm fired up. I'm mad. I'm on my soapbox, whatever it might be. You see, we look at this and we say, love is just something that's a secondhand emotion. It's great when it's great, but man, it is hard when it's hard. But you see, love is not just an emotion. Love is a lifestyle. And that's why Jesus tells us, and he tells his disciples in John, the 13th chapter, he says, by this, not your emotions. I'm an emotional guy. I am too emotional for my own good. I know you're like, what? Yes, oh my goodness, I'm bad. He says, by this, all will know. By what? Love. By your love. By the fact that you love others the way I loved others. And if we're honest about how Jesus loved, it wasn't always mushy and gushy and sweet love. In Mark, the 10th chapter, Jesus sees a rich young ruler. The Bible says that Jesus, looking at him, loving him, told him, hey, man, the problem is you, you're wrapped up in your possessions. Sell everything you have and come and follow me and you'll find treasure in heaven. The Bible tells us that rich young ruler, he went away sad because he knew that he was wrapped up in his possessions. You see, love isn't always cuddling. Love isn't always, isn't always you know, lifting. Love is real. Love is hard. Jesus loved his disciples enough to tell them, but he also understood timing. And he also understood reaffirmation. I mean, you look at when, when Jesus told Peter, get behind me, Satan. That's love? You know, right after that, Jesus told him what was about to happen. Because Peter said, Jesus, you can't die. We're not going to let that happen. You can't let that happen. And then all of a sudden, Jesus tells him why. He tells him what's going on. He says, listen, man, you, you don't know what you're talking about. And he gives them and he lays them out. Whether they saw it or not, Jesus let them know. Why? Because you see, his love was genuine. His love was honest. His love was real. And when we look at love as an emotion, when we look at love as a Christian brother and a Christian uh, sister, when we see that as how we feel, and it's easy when it's good, but it's hard when it's hard, then all of a sudden love doesn't look and act like Jesus. You know, one of the things that we were so funny, we had the staff lunch today and everybody was talking. And, you know, have you ever heard that saying, the two things you don't talk about are religion and politics? Anybody ever heard that before? Those are just the two things you just don't discuss. Religion and politics. You don't talk about it. Because you're going to stir everybody up. Man, I tell you, it was fun because we had a discussion about religion and politics. But you know what I think what happens is sometimes because we're not supposed to talk about religion and politics, we got to get it out somehow. And so what we do is we begin to mix religion and politics. We begin to take our politics and apply them to our Christianity. We begin to take our United States of America, human rights, all, all men are created equal, all men have been given certain unalienable rights. We begin to take those and we begin to apply those to our Christianity because you see, we have rights that say, I can say what I want to say. I can do what I want to do, and I can be what I want to be. But you see, Christianity says that I'll be held accountable for what I say, for what I do, and what I become. But what we like to do is we like to say, well, I'm an American, and I'm a Christian. And because of that, I will take my politics, and I will put them into my beliefs, and I will apply them that way. But you see, that's not how Jesus loved. 
Jesus didn't do it like that. He was real. He was open and he was transparent. And because of that, Jesus gave us a commandment. Not to love like we think we should love, but to love like he loved. To love like he loved. Because what happens is when we begin to take our political mindsets or our rights given to us by our nation, our country, the free world, whatever it might be, and we apply that to our Christianity, we become searchers. We become purveyors. We become transgression seekers. You could say it like this. Moral police. We Christians, in the name of love, begin to become moral police. You're doing something. They're doing something. I don't agree with what they stand for. That's an evil corporation. That person, whatever it might be. And we begin to speak out in love to inform those around us what they need to know and what they need to understand. But did you know that God never called us to be moral police? As a matter of fact, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take God's job. Did you know that? Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit. He says when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Jesus says, hey, man, you got to watch out. You don't judge. Because what you judge, it'll be judged back to you. But we like to take God's position. We want to be moral police because it's easy to get on our soapbox. It's easy to, to look at what all the issues of the world are. And all of a sudden now we've become purveyors of transgression, looking for whatever reason we can to point out that something is not right in the world. Because it's easy, right? You guys with me? You're staring at me like a cow in the gate. Have I lost you? Case in point. Right? Some of you are like, what the heck are you talking about, Pastor Luke? Amen. I love the fact that you don't know what this is all about. Somebody somewhere, in some point in time, saw that there was a cup from a coffee company that didn't say Merry Christmas. And they threw a fit. They got, on a, they, they got all riled up. They got on a, on a stage, on a soapbox, and they got everybody involved. The news is talking about it. Social media is talking about it. Everybody's talking about a stupid red cup. Because what happens is when we forget to live in love, we become seekers of transgression. But the world, but them, but you, but you don't understand what's going on. No, 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 no. Jesus wasn't interested in cups. Now, this isn't a message about Starbucks. I don't care about a cup. But what it does show, the fact that a cup with Christians making such a buzz of what it is, is like Tina Turner's song, revealing the true character behind Christianity in the 21st century. That we like to major on the minors and minor on the majors. Because we are seekers of transgressions. Because we want to be the moral police of the world. But Jesus says, the world will not know that you're my followers because you're the moral police. He said, the world will know that you're my followers because you love as I have loved you. And we miss it. We literally miss the bus. And now some of you say, well, Pastor Luke, there's such a deeper issue to the company that, that put out the red cup. And I will answer that in a moment. I'm not done with that. But so what do we do? What do we do? Pastor Luke, okay, all right, you know, society, you're not talking about me. I'm talking about everybody, every one of us. You raised your hand earlier today. We're talking together. What do we do? It's so simple. It's so simple. Jesus, the Paul, the apostle, James, the Bible tells us that we need to do something so simple and so easy with our lives. And this is it. Pursue love. Pursue it. You know, I could say, walk in love. Amen. Amen, Pastor Luke. There are some Christians in this world that need to walk in love. Psh, they don't even know. No, no, no. I'm not. Pursue love. You see, walk in love is like so simple and so brain dead and so, so like basic that nobody would even listen. Y'all shut off right there. But pursue love. Pursue love. Why? Because there's too much division in church. 
There's too much division across denominations. There's too much division across social issues and Republicans and Democrats and moderates and independents. There's too much division. Jesus says that we're like a body. We all play a part. But you see, in the big picture, in the, in the micro of the church, we're like this severed body. Like the hand is over here doing its own thing in the name of Methodism, and, and the foot is over here in the name of, of Protestantism, and, 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 and the neck is over here in the name of Catholicism, whatever you want to call it. But we're all divided because we think we are best, if we're honest. That's why we're here. But Jesus says, you won't be known because you're the best. He even said, you won't be known because you're right. He said, you'll be known because you love like I loved. And in, in, in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, I'll put up on the overhead, the, the love verse, Paul the Apostle, if you've got time, you ought to read that verse. Paul the Apostle says these words at the very end of the 13th chapter. Paul the Apostle says, now abide in faith, hope, and love. But look at this, the greatest of these is love. You know what happens is we look at the verses and we look at the chapters in the Bible. And because it's a new chapter or it's a new verse, we cut it off. That's a great, stop. That's a great place to stop today's reading, put a bookmark, come back there again, pick it up at another time, right? But the interesting thing is chapter 14, verse number 1, continues the exact same thought. Because he's talking about the church. You think you're better over here because of this gift. And you think you're better over here because of this gift. Look what he says in verse number 14. He says, pursue Love and desire spiritual gifts. Man, I want to look good. I want to have spiritual gifts. But he says, pursue it. You know that word pursue? It's the same word for persecution. It's the same word for hunt. To seek out. You see, when you persecute, you've been there. You've been on a vendetta. Man, you are like ready. Oh, man, you are awake at night scheming and planning and thinking about it. Thinking, man, I'm going to say this and I'm going to say that. And, and I'm putting all this up because it feels good. Right? He says, pursue it like that. Give all your effort. Throw everything at it. Love. Because you see, love's not just an emotion. Love is a lifestyle. And it's not just a lifestyle. It's the way. It's the calling card in which we, the followers of Jesus, are identified. Not by our church attendance. Not by our sticker. Not by the denomination that we belong to. Not by our, our, our economic status. Not by our national status. Not by any of that. The thing that we are known as followers of Jesus is by love. That is why it's so important. What's love got to do with it? Everything. Everything. And so what happens is, you know what? We read the Bible and we pursue knowledge because knowledge is important. Wisdom. I want to get smarter. I want to get deeper in the Word of God. I want to have deeper understanding of the spiritual things that Jesus talked about because sometimes when I read the Bible, it's like whoosh, over my head. So we pursue knowledge. But we can't pursue knowledge at the cost of love. Because look what Paul the Apostle says. I'll put it in the, eight, in, in the NLT on the, on the screen in 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter. Paul the Apostle says, regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols. Look what he says. He says, yes, we know. We all have knowledge about the issue. Paul says, look, man, I know. We all know what we can do about this food. But look what he says. But while knowledge makes us feel important, love is what strengthens the church. Hmm. Verse number two, anyone who claims to know all the answers, soapbox, doesn't really know very much. And look what Paul says, verse number three, the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. Calling card. The calling card of Jesus Christ. The identification of which we are known as followers is not the label that we put on ourselves, is not the stickers that we have on our cars, is not the, the, the economic or the social or the political stance that we take. The calling card is the fact that we operate in love like Jesus loved, and that is the one who God sees. So we get fired up. We get offended. We get hurt. We, we, we pursue knowledge, and we do so at the cost of love. My daddy taught me a long time ago, and he learned it from his dad who was a great salesman. My dad told me a long time ago, you know, son, you can win the argument and lose the sale. And there are far too many Christians today that are winning the argument, but we're losing the sale. 
You see, you might win the moral argument. You might win the social argument. You might win the political argument with the word of God and, and, and your being riled up and my being riled up. But you see, we're losing the sale. Because even though we might be taking a moral and a, and, and, and a higher stand, what we're doing is we're not reinforcing the words of Jesus Christ. We're diminishing the words of Jesus Christ. So it's not so much about a cup. It's not so much about what my dollar goes to. It's not so much about what somebody did to me and you don't understand the obligation and the right that I have to say them. No, the right that we have is to understand that we carry weight with a platform. And church, we are a generation, old and young alike, that have had something that nobody else has had before, and that's a platform where you can speak to the world at once via a few short words. And understand that our words carry a weight in the fact that they will either uh, reinforce or they will diminish what Jesus Christ said. And the world will know, the world will know that we are followers of Jesus if we love like Jesus loved. But, Pastor Luke, Pastor Luke, Jesus braided a whip. Jesus got crazy. He called people snakes, and he called people vipers, and he said that they were like cops that were rotten on the inside. I mean, Jesus was like crazy. You thought Pastor Jim was a tell it like it is? You should see what, what Jesus said. Can I ask you a question? Who did Jesus say that to? The religious. Why? Because the religious were upset with who Jesus was spending his time with. Remember that story? The, the, the Pharisees come to Jesus' disciple and they say, Jesus, why, why is your master always hanging out with tax collectors and sick people? But Pastor Luke, now, again, I don't care about the company. But Pastor Luke, people always tell me this, there's a company and they have unrighteous beliefs. They have a stand for something that is unbiblical. We should boycott them as Christians. Now I'm stepping on some toes. But if we boycott every company that's unrighteous, then what are we doing? We're secluding ourselves. But you see, Paul the Apostle, when he was talking to the church in Corinthians, he says, listen, man, it's not your jo job to judge the people outside of the world. And he says, it's not your job to segregate from the people outside the world because you would have to literally be removed from the face of the earth in order for that to happen. But Pastor Luke, they have a stance that is against the Bible. And I'm not talking about this company. To be honest, I don't like their product. It's too bitter for me. <laughs> but that aside, if we as Christians were to boycott every company that took an unbiblical stance, who would witness to the person behind the counter? Who would share the love of Jesus to that person behind the register that needs, to love, that needs to know that Jesus loves them and that somebody cares for them? Who would drop a card that says, come to my church? Who would say, you know what? If you need me, I'm here for you because you've been making my coffee all day long or for, for five years and you know me better than anybody else knows me. Who would do that? Who would do that? Because Jesus spent his time with tax collectors and sick people. Paul the Apostle and the disciples, as they were on their missionary journeys, journeys you know where they went? They, didn't, they, they went to the marketplace to find the business people, the people that were making idols, the people that were carving graved images, the people that were doing all sorts of ungodly things. Why? Because Jesus said, I have come to the sick. I, the, the healthy don't need a doctor. The sick need a doctor. The world, Christians, they don't need anybody else telling them how bad they are. They already know it. What we need is somebody to tell us how much God loves us. Because that's what we need. 
And I know it's a tough message. I'm stepping on your toes. You're like, Pastor Luke, I'm mad at you. What's love got to do with it? Amen. <laughs> First Peter chapter 4. I'll put it up on the overhead. Peter says, man, look, at the times are over, man. It's getting, it's, the day is getting late. End times are coming. And above all things, he says, have fervent love for one another. Why? Because love will cover a multitude of sins. But they wronged me. They have the wrong opinion of the word of God. They're saying things that I, I just don't know if, if I can really get a hold of. They're saying bad things about me. Love will cover a multitude of sins. Proverbs in the 10th chapter says that hatred stirs up strife. But love covers. Jesus tells us, the world will know you belong to me. Not because you raise your hand in a church service. Not because you attend, not because you have a sticker on your car, not because you carry a, a little, you know, trinket on your keychain. The world will know that you belong to me because you love as I have loved. And I tell you what, I, I've been on my soapbox way too much. I've been thinking that I'm better off way too much. I've been thinking, you know what, they don't know over here, they don't know over there, and man, if they only did what I would do, way too much. Because you realize when Jesus was saying this, he was washing his disciples' feet and he washed Judas' feet. The man who betrayed him that night, he washed Judas' feet too. And he says, if you love like I love. So what do we do, church? We pursue it. We chase after it. We run after love. Why? Because it's not an emotion. It's not something that happens when we feel good. It's something that we chase. It's something that we dedicate. It's something that we pursue. It's something that we, we, we spend a time, a priority in our life, thinking what would love do right now and not what would I do. Because we want the world to know that Jesus exists to seek and to save the lost. And Jesus says to those who have been forgiven of much, they have much love. Church, we have been forgiven through Jesus Christ of so much. And because of that, who cares about a cup? Who cares about what somebody else is doing over here, what somebody else said about that? Who cares about the, new, the, the, the latest and greatest celebrity struggles with their life? Who cares? What's so important for us is that we love like Jesus loved which is honest, which is real, which is timely, and which is from the heart. And how do we do that? We do that because we pursue it, like Paul the Apostle said, to chase it, to study it. Listen, knowledge is great, and we need knowledge. You need to pursue knowledge. But you need to not pursue knowledge at the cost of love. Love should always be the thing that we pursue the most. Beyond anything else, Paul says, the greatest of these is love. Pursue it. Yes, amen. The greatest of these is love. Pursue it. When we get in our Bible, love like Jesus loved. Read your Gospels. Read the book of John. Read the book of 1 John, 2 John. John is the epistle of, of love, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And when we study how Jesus loved, we'll see how Paul loved. We'll see how Peter loved. We'll see how James loved. And we'll see that these men who loved overturned the world, overcame the Roman Empire, and brought something that, that didn't take a sword, that didn't take violence, but rather was a movement that changed the course of history because it was done in love. That is what happens when we pursue love. So simple, so easy. I understand you, Pastor Luke, I didn't need to come to hear that, but yeah, we need to be reminded of it. Because I need to be reminded of it. Because I'm an emotional person who struggles with pride. And we need to commit to pursuing love so that people would know that Jesus is in control, not me. Did you guys get something out of that tonight? Now, I totally lied. Incapable of a 20-minute message. So tonight, if that's you in this place, the Bible says it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. If you're in this place tonight, I want to ask, give me a minute. I promise it won't take a long time. Now everybody's like, I got to get up and go. I know. I'll let you out in just a minute, I promise. Give me, give me a moment of your time. If you're in this place and you don't know Jesus, if you're in this place and you're under the pretense that everything's okay because you think or you hope or because you've been attending church, I've, I've, I've covered all those messages, all those points in the message. Tonight, simply put, I'm going to just say it like this tonight. 
The Bible says it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. And if you look into your heart, the Bible says that if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. You've got to look into your own heart and be honest. Sometimes the hardest thing we can do as human beings is to look and, have, be, and, and be open and honest about the condition of our own lives. Like I said, you don't need another person telling you how bad you are or how many mistakes you've made, all the dumb things you've done in your life. You already know all those things. But today you need somebody to tell you that God loves you. God loved you so much that despite all of that, the Bible says he sent Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, the only way to get to heaven, to spend eternal life with God and to have fulfillment on earth. Maybe you're in this place and you're looking for answers. You're looking for something. Maybe you've never affiliated with Christianity. You're not really familiar on it. You've only been a few times or you only heard what they, they, what you only seen what they talked about on news or on the TV. But listen, let me tell you something. Christianity is so far different than what you think it is because it's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's surrendering your life and your heart to Jesus. By giving him your all, Jesus says, I'd rather see that. I want to see that you're born again. He says, unless you're born again, you cannot inherit or see the kingdom of God. But born again isn't what you think. It's not that crazy, out of control, weirdo Christianity kind of thing. Born again is meaning I give all of my heart. I give all of my life to Jesus Christ. And today I want to give you the opportunity. The Bible tells us that the gift of God is eternal salvation. And I want to give you the opportunity to receive a gift. I was with some friends or some family uh, just a couple of days ago, and they just bought my kids gifts. And my kids openly and, and widely received them. You know, with any gift, you have a choice. Do you want to take it in or do you want to reject it? Do you want to say, no, I'm all right with that. I don't need that. You see, God's not going to force his way or make his way in. You've got to open up your heart and be honest with yourself today. And if you look in your heart, the Spirit of God speaking to you right now, you say, man, you know what? I need Jesus. My life's just not where it should be. I need Jesus. My heart, it's just, it's just not where it should be. I need Jesus. You know what? I, I, there's, there's so many things that are going on in my life that are wrong. I, I feel like I just need something right. And today is the day for you to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So here's what we're going to do. I told you we're going to do things a little bit differently today. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. It's been a little bit out of the ordinary tonight. But I'm going to believe that the Spirit of God is speaking to you. And I'm going to ask you to do something bold. And I'm going to do it. we're going to do it together tonight. If you need Jesus, if you've never given your heart, you've never given your life, if you've been playing games, you've been thinking you're doing all right because you're playing the church thing, doing the church thing all Wednesdays or once a month or once a week or whatever it might be, but you know during work when you're with the people that, are, that, are, uh, that know you the best, you know you're not really fully doing this. I want you to do something. I want you to grab your purse, your Bible, your friend, if you need a friend. I want you to just come out of your seat and I want you to come meet me right here because I want to change destinies with you. You see, it's time for you to stop running from God and it's time for you to start running to God. And you've got to give your heart and you've got to give your life to Jesus Christ. And today, I believe with all of my heart, is the day of your salvation. So I'm going to ask Elijah if he'd do, do me a favor and he'd just sing a song. He's going to sing a cool song. And if that's you in this place, you say, you know what, man, I know in my life I need Jesus. Today, I want you to take that bold step to get out of your seat, get out of your chair and come meet me. I want to shake your hand and we're going to change destinies together right here, right now. Would you do that for me, my, bud, my friend? Come on, you come. And he loves us and you come, come on. This is your time. This is your moment. Not time to leave. It's time to come forward. You come, come on. The Spirit of God speaking to you. It's your moment. Come on. Yeah. You come. This is your moment. This is your time. Come on. Have you seen the Spirit of God move? I'm not trying to convince you. I'm not trying to play you. This is your time. The Spirit of God speaking to you. It's time for you to respond. Keep going, Elijah, one more time, buddy. Yes, she loves us. And oh, how he loves us. If that's you in this place, come on, don't leave without making sure. Don't leave. Don't walk out of this place assuming. I'm not trying to convince you. Man, I feel like I have to convince you. I can feel the opposition. But the Spirit of God is the one speaking to you saying, come. Come. And if the Spirit of God speaking to you, don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. You know what? Bro, is your name Nate? Yeah. Nate, dude, listen. There are like, you need to hear this. There are like 10 other people, at least in this auditorium right now, that need to be up here with you. 
But you know what, dude? You can. The Bible says, heaven rejoices over one person coming to Jesus Christ. And I just got to tell you, Nate, from my heart to your heart, bro, you are making the best decision you'll ever make in your entire life. Just pump it, bro. We do this. We're running late, but I'm going to pray with you. I said I'm going to do this. Pastor, I'm going to pray with them, but I'm, Pastor Joel is going to talk to you, all right? He's going to hang out with you, okay? I want you to pray, and everybody else is going to pray, okay, Nate? Listen, God doesn't listen to the words of your lips. He listens to the prayer of your heart, okay? So it's not an abracadabra. You're at, you're, you're doing this together. We're going to pray together. You're going to accept Jesus in your heart and your life. And I want everybody in this place to repeat this prayer after me because I know that you're in this place, and I know that you know, man, that's me right now. But at least you can do is pray this prayer right now because I don't want you to walk out of this place without that opportunity. So I want everybody in this house to repeat this prayer after me. Let's all pray. Father God, Father God I come before you, I come before and I acknowledge that I need you. I acknowledge I can't do this by myself. Today, I recognize, I believe, I profess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died on a cross for my sins. Who, who forgave me of my sins. I believe that he rose again and that he is seated with you. And today, I accept Jesus as my leader, as my Savior. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Lord, today, I make a commitment with all of my heart to follow you, to love like you loved. Show me your love so that I can return it to this world. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. I'm leaving hell behind. I'm going forward for Jesus. Headed for heaven. I'm a child of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Give me a hug, bro. Listen, this guy right here, he's my buddy. Pastor Joel is going to take you right over there. He's going to give you some free information, and he's going to invite you to come back and hang out with a friend. We're going to, we're going to hook you up with a friend, okay, to teach you some things about the Word of God. So you just listen to what he says. Your family, your friends will be here. We're not, not nothing weird. He's just going to give you some stuff, all right? Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye. <laughs>